about connective tissue and in these patients connective tissue uh, very simply put connective tissue in these patients is softer than in other people um, it's not a disease it's not it's just a form of the human body just like you have tall people short people black people white people they all have their own set of medical conditions patients with ehlers danlos syndromes have softer connective tissue so they have their own set of medical conditions as compared to somebody who does not have ehlers danlos syndrome uh, but i for those of you who are practitioners just make sure that patients understand that that this is not a uh, condition that's this is not a disease that they have to live with they were born with and they have to live with it's just a form um, <clears throat> it's it's a it's a it's actually a, a far more complex condition that we initially thought it to be um, at first we had thought it is just oh it's just a joint issue these patients have um, very hypermobile joints and that's all it is but over the last decade we've come to realize that it is a lot more than that and these are the things that you'll see in excuse me in patients with <clears throat> ehlers danlos syndrome uh, they may have an autoimmune dysfunction they can have cranio cervical instability joint instability uh, something called pots or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome uh they can have a tethered cord syndrome their, their spinal cords are tethered they can have mast cell activation syndrome and i'll kind of briefly touch on some of the more important ones mast cell activation syndrome is uh is a growing uh, issue right now patients are beginning to develop sensitivities to different chemicals foods drugs all sorts of issues um their immune system goes is going it goes haywire uh they have abdominal pain and then they have carry malformation which is essentially herniation of the of the brain through the foramen magnum or the hole in the skull so a patient with eds can have any or some or all of these conditions and it, it's it's a it's it's for us uh, to be able to differentiate like what are these uh, what are the issues and how do we in order to get them better we really need to cover all of these or whatever these patients have so if somebody somebody comes in with say joint instability and mast cell activation syndrome we really have to cover treat their mast cell and the joint instability to get them functional and the idea behind treatment of pain i just want to make mention is is to is it's not as much as bringing the pain down it's about being functional um, i know for sure that if i close my eyes and think of all the body parts that hurt i'll probably come up with 20 of them but that didn't stop me from going to work this morning and <clears throat> so i'm functional but the day when i when this pain or any one of these pains becomes so bad that i can't function that's when i start to worry and i need to we need to fix that so i call this being more functional rather than worrying about is your pain skill you know 0 to 10 or is it 5 it that makes no sense to me and it really doesn't i mean i could there are people out there who have 9 or 10 pain are still functional and then there are people who have 4 out of 10 pain and just can't function uh, it's not because they are these people with 4 or 10 patients a pain are 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 wimpy it's because it's their grading is different they don't understand i don't know what 10 or 10 pain means um, so that's that's the way to look at it is to so what i do is i don't ask them their number i say like um there has it affected your functioning and how much has it affected your functioning and that's my my goal or my criteria for finding out how badly they are affected uh, so in eds there are three things to know uh, like i said it's not a disease uh, they have soft connective tissues so everything in the human body is connected so you have the muscles ligaments skin bones joints they're all connected to each other and they're all the tissue that connects them is called connective tissue obviously because it connects everything so <clears throat> connective tissue in these patients is softer it's more elastic um they have poor joint position sense or also known as proprioception um and that's something that you will you these it's not particular to just eds uh, toddlers have it they have not yet developed their joint position sense so they tend to fall as they learn how to walk the elderly they tend to uh, lose their joint position sense that's one of the reasons why they fall a lot is because they are not they're not and i'll get into proprioception in greater detail but 
it's a, it's a normal physiological phenomenon that happens. Uh, patients who have got joint replacement surgeries, um, they don't have joint great joint position sense. Um, and then they come up with also have patients with EDS have coexisting conditions, as I mentioned uh, previously. <clears throat> so how common or how rare is this condition? We don't really know for sure. And the reason we don't know is because we are missing these diagnoses. Uh, but to give you an example, rheumatoid arthritis is 41 in 100,000. Crohn's disease is 10 in 100,000. And from a very conservative measure, we know that Ellis Danlos syndrome is 10 in 100,000. Now, everybody knows Crohn's disease. Uh, everybody knows rheumatoid arthritis. But when you mention Ellis Danlos syndrome and they just look at you like, huh, what? So we think the presumed frequency is about 1% in the general population. Uh, that number is way lower than what, what we really think it is, uh, but we haven't been able to do it. We, haven't, we don't have accurate statistics because we are missing these diagnoses. So for those who are out there in practice who are treating patients, um, I can assure you that you have already seen patients with EDS and you are definitely going to see patients with EDS. And I'm gonna teach you today how to diagnose these people, how to find out if they have it or not. So <clears throat> moving on to types of EDS, um, there are 13 subtypes of EDS, and I'm not gonna, most of them are all rare um, types of EDS. They, uh, the common ones are classic EDS, um, the classical type EDS, um, that's written as small c, capital EDS. And then there's the hypermobile or the hypermobility EDS, which is uh, the commonest kind. <clears throat> and then you have the vascular EDS, which is written as a small v EDS. And then you have uh, another 10 different subtypes, which are extremely rare. I mean, when I say rare, they are as rare as like seeing uh, seven patients, seven people in the entire world, uh, as rare as that. <clears throat> so, Deborah, I think you've seen a number of people over the years. I, I've, I've in my time, which is nowhere close to you all, I've seen a number of people that I thought had Ellis Danlos, and uh, I, in fact, I have someone right now who has. Uh, been having significant injuries since pretty young and really actually almost seeking out um, things which would cause a lot of people discomfort or pain, extreme ranges of experiences that I suspect has um, EDS. I don't know what your experience, Deborah, has been in how people show up and what their backgrounds are like. Yeah, I mean, I think David's seen a lot of people. We've all seen so many people with this hypermobility. And sometimes people just are very flexible. But when they have the syndrome, which exists on a continuum, it's a, they have a kind of similar history. They usually present in their early 30s, maybe late 20s, having had an incredibly active life. And I, my feeling is, is or hypothesis is, is that they feel so free in their body. <laughs> they're not, you know, they feel so free in their body and dancing and ice skating and uh, circus arts, uh, martial arts. And then then they start getting injured. Funny little injuries, right? Their knee dislocates. They tear ACL. Their shoulder is injured. Their finger joints. And then they go to doctor after doctor. And many doctors, it was such a breath of fresh air to hear Dr. Chopra talk about it so uh, comprehensively about the whole person, but they go to many doctors who then just think they're kind of crazy. They try physical therapists, they're not given appropriate things to do, and then they get more injured and more injured and more and more isolated, and then they come to us. <laughs> and I think it's, a, it's so much easier to work with people who are stiff and get them to kind of move a little bit than to get people who are so flexible in how to organize and how to work with the initiation of movement so you get that stabilization of the joints. Uh, that's been my uh, main experience is that this this history, when people like start telling you all of these things are happening, I had this woman come recently 
And I called up her doctor and I said, you know, I think she has Ehlers-Danlos. Like, that's the reason all this has been happening to her. And he said, really? I, I only saw one person like that in my fellow, in my uh, internship. You know, I didn't think that was a real thing. So there's not a lot. And there's no diagnostic test that you can take a blood sample or an X-ray. You know, it's all on the clinical story where you need time to listen, which we have. Um, and uh, there's so much that we do. And I'm sure David can talk about a lot of that, too, that we do that's automatic within the system of the method that helps people to feel um, themselves again. And and one term that I think uh, Feldenkrais people need to know that Dr. Chopra brought in was this term kinesiophobia, the fear of movement. It's just once people know, like, whoa, there's an actual term that describes this fear and how can we work with someone to do small things like just how to come up to stand skeletally so that you're not damaging your hips and your knees and your ankles and your neck um, because they have become so afraid to do anything um, yeah I don't want to take all the time but I could go on and on <laughs> about that Yeah, I, my, my hypothesis is slightly different than yours. It's interesting. I, I've been wondering, since they actually have less proprioceptive information, there's actually less receptors in their tissue, in their joints, if maybe going to the end range of motion uh, also allows them to feel and sense more, that maybe they don't get mm -hmm. as much information early on. Um, yeah. But it could also just be that it's just, you know, maybe, and maybe that's the same thing that they feel so free and easy in their body, maybe it actually is the same thing. Right, right. Uh, but so then things look like more like a very risky sort of over, sort of the Cirque du Soleil kinds of m movements that some of us might think of um, as being, you know, incredibly flexible. They, they tend to go more towards those bigger, larger, uh, you know, often do really great at yoga, right? In in the beginning, the, you know, they think yoga is, fabulous and they excel at yoga and even become yoga teachers often uh, that I, in my experience and then start to start to try to have to ratchet it back and try to figure out what, what else they can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that lack of proprioceptive information is very important. Uh, Chopra also refers to use of kinesio tape, which is something that I do use a lot to help people and teach people how to put it on, which provides just some kind of, it's like someone holding your joints for you a little bit. It's a little bio. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like a kind of biofeedback. Yeah. I mean, I think there's the whole, then there's the um, POTS, P-O-T-S, postural orthostatic, uh, da -da, <laughs> syndrome, or when they start up, their blood pressure drops, right? Yeah. And also the organs, they can get uh, something called gastroparesis, where the stomach stays extended and doesn't really move food through them. So if some one of your clients has something like that, then that is a more medical issue that they really should be evaluated by a physician. The the straight hypermobility, I think Feldenkrais people are quite uh, capable of helping someone like that. But people start telling you like they stand up and they faint or they their food is in their stomach for three days. Um, that should be evaluated because it could lead to a serious medical Okay. Yeah, you know, but I mean, Dr. Chopra was off, offline ahead of time, was really wanting to find somebody to help with both of those issues. Um, mm -hmm. So he was saying, look, I'm hoping that that maybe in all of the stuff that you're doing, you might mm -hmm. actually end up making a difference in both of those issues. So I thought that was uh, and I think it's possible over the long haul, particularly in the um, in the pots. I David, take us on a little bit of a journey uh, about how how we help people get that skeletal awareness for people who are listening who do. You know, this might be the only talk they listen to the whole time. <laughs> give, us, give us a little. Don't well, listen, they shouldn't, be. They shouldn't listen to your whole program. Yeah. Um, well, I I do so so um, I do. Per I do a lot of things with, I've, I've, I see a lot of people in my practice with EDS, some diagnosed, some on the spectrum, uh, some with, with, with very, very serious um, 
medical problems linked to it. Uh, and, and I just first want to go back to something where you're talking about them seeking out activities, which is that um, the, role of, the role of hormones, that when one is young, now one feels one can do anything. Right? You're not gonna you're not gonna get a forty year old going off to war. You get a twenty year old. And uh, a lot of times I I find that the people I see with hypermobility issues, they are doing extreme things. And of course you can say it's because that's where they, they feel themselves or that's when they get the proprioceptive feedback at the at the at the end range. But I think it's also driven by this linkage between the, their, the normal hormonal activity of youth and, um, and it, creates profound, it creates real problems because then you don't, as a young person, you don't want to feel as if you're being held back mm -hmm. from doing the most adventurous things that you're interested in. Um, so I work, I work, a, so the other thing is, I think that we could probably do a better job of speaking to these issues, I don't know, in advanced trainings or in the, in the training program itself, in, in the sense that um, most of what we do is so linked towards helping a person to be able to move more easily and with less effort and in fact, the needs of somebody with hypermobility are quite different. So it's, it's getting a set, beginning to, to, to create a very accurate and defined um, appreciation for where my skeleton is in space. Yes. And, and then that, of course, then that, that improves. If, if your postural sway is not so big, then you're less likely to have to rely on this unusual, the, the tendons and ligaments are, are gonna be under much less strain. And there, there's lots of interesting studies showing that, that people with uh, poor proprioception, people who have, let's say, very significant uh, scoliosis, their postural sway is much larger meaning it, it compounds the whole thing. In other words, to know, to know where I, when I'm upright, when I'm stable, I have to move further than, than you do. So then of course, if I move further away from equilibrium, it, it puts a, a real load on, on, uh, on the tendons and ligaments. So, um, yeah, so so I work a lot with them with with the skeleton and pushing the pressure through the skeleton. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, Moshe would do a lot of tapping stuff. Yeah. Um, not the kind of tapping on uh, not mm. the, the tapping that we know from uh, Hava, but but you thinking of the skeleton tapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know this is a Feldenkrais uh, awareness summit, but I'm, since movement intelligence was included and since Ruthie Alon's a longtime student of Moshe's, I, I find the bones for life processes, which are so right down the middle of the yeah. skeleton, to just be fabulous for people right. with Feller Stanlos. I mean, it's just such a clear skeletal connection, lying on your back pressure going up and down through very little emphasis on flexibility in her work. There's some, but not much. I mean, she's really, her work is about kind of coming in and getting tall and long. And so it's a kind of uh, self-compression uh, containment work. Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, I think that the, all those elements can be in Feldenkrais. Um, uh, oh, the Feldenkrais oh, yeah. body is huge, right? It's just huge. Right. And so, and maybe, Culturally, we also love flexibility. I mean, we really do uh, kind of love flexibility. And, and of course we talk about the importance of flexibility in all ways for a human being, uh, but in the Feldenkrais work, but um, you'd have to, you have to work a little bit harder to hone and pull out 
the Feldenkrais components for somebody with EDS, I guess is my, my impression. You have to think about it a little more. Yeah, that exactly. You, you can't go by rote. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you have to think about percussion and mm -hmm. pressure in different ways. You know, it's as if the, the skeleton is the conduit of the, the percussive instruments and the orchestra, you know, it's, it, and, um, and I think that that notion of percussion and pressure is extremely primitive. I think that the, mm -hmm. the simplest of the, the skeleton evolved probably, right, from some, the beginning of a, some exoskeleton of having to not just keep the system together, but, but put it, applying pressure against uh, the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, or against yeah. the water or against the mud um so i i i go i go, in my mm -hmm. thinking i go back to those ideas 